Can we hide the Earth from possible alien invaders? What's the deal with the pyramids and their alignment to the stars? Can an interstellar ship crash into a black hole? And Q&A Plus, what's the difference between cosmology and astronomy after all? All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Rod Tolosa. Could there be life on Venus similar to life deep in our oceans wasn't phosphorus detected? So the detection that you're talking about was phosphine, which is a, a chemical that's here on Earth that's produced by bacteria. And astronomers think that they might have detected the presence of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. And so if you know if bacteria on Earth produces it, then maybe bacteria on Venus is producing the phosphine. But there are probably inorganic ways that phosphine could be produced. So you know, this is a controversy in the astro bio community. Now what you're talking about, though, is could there be life underground, like the surface of Venus is more than 400 centigrade, uh, just choose a metal with a low melting point to compare it to, you could bake a pizza on Venus, you know, so the temperature on the surface is incredibly hot. But the question you're asking is, if you could just go down deeper from the surface, then maybe you could have more reasonable temperatures. And the answer is no, uh, it just gets hotter. So, uh, you know, here on Earth, the, at the center of the Earth, the temperature is like 6000 Kelvin, which is the same temperature as the surface of the sun, roughly. And that as you get closer to the surface, then the temperature gets lower and lower. And eventually, you know, you reach the surface of planet Earth, and the temperature is the average temperature of the planet. But wherever you go, if you go down, say, you know, a kilometer or two, uh, it heats up. And so at a certain point, I think it's about six, seven kilometers down. Uh, it's the limit of what life can handle. But the temperature starts at the surface and then gets hotter as it goes down towards the core. And so the same thing is going to be happening on Venus, except the surface is already hotter than what bacteria can handle. And then it's just going to get hotter. So unfortunately, if you tried to go deep underground on Venus, you wouldn't be able to find any viable life. You need a cooler temperature on the surface, and then it could get warm enough. Now you could have that kind of a situation on other worlds where it is cold where it's exposed to space. Think about the moon, for example. People have proposed that there could be life on the moon, that on the surface of the moon, way too hot. But as you go down into the moon, the temperatures increase and there could be some place inside where the temperature reaches enough to make liquid water. And wherever we find liquid water on Earth, we find life. And so if there's liquid water inside the moon and maybe sources of chemicals that they could be using, then that could allow life to form. And you can imagine that going on across the entire solar system, the entire universe, wherever you have this boundary, really cold, hot interior planet, water present on the world, then there could be some zone where life could, you know, find a way. Abstracted away, is there any effort to spot helium rich dwarf stars as a techno signature? If any civilization achieves star lifting, that would be a way to see it, right? That's an interesting idea. And I have no idea. Um, I just wanted to sort of like put a pin in that and think about it. So uh, thank you. So what this means is that I, you know, I do review after I complete every question show and I go through every uh, question that I answered and think about whether I did a good job of answering the question or if look at the questions that I avoided because I didn't know the answer and then I research the answers and then I put them into my Anki to be better next time. So uh, yeah, that's a really cool question. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, maybe I will check the literature and see if anybody's ever done that because it's a clever idea. Kenji, I just want to know the truth about the pyramids and why they line them up with certain stars. Because ancient people were incredible astronomers that they deeply understood the motions of the stars in the sky. And it was a trivial task for them to line up the positions of objects on the surface of the Earth with the things they saw in the sky Stonehenge, I don't know if the pyramids are truly lined up to match what is it Orion's belt or something like that. But there's way better observations. You know, my favorite of this is actually Hipparchus, who is the grandfather of measuring the positions of the stars in the sky. And he produced this first incredibly accurate um, catalog of all the stars in the sky. He did like 850 stars in his original catalog, the brightest stars that you could see. Other astronomers at the time thought that maybe the Earth orbited around the sun and that they were 
They knew that if the Earth did orbit around the sun, then you would end up with a parallax where the stars would change their position in the sky depending on whether the Earth was to the you know, on one side of the sun or the other side of the sun. And so they tried to to do the math to do the geometry to figure out whether or not the stars were bouncing back and forth, but they only had their eyes they had these tiny little sighting tubes that they would use to measure the positions of the stars, they didn't have a telescope at the time. And so they weren't able to gather enough evidence to know definitively that the sun is the center of the universe, and not the earth is the center of the universe. And so they went with the earth is the center of the universe, because they couldn't see the parallax. That's how good they were at knowing the positions of the stars, they would measure the positions of the stars to know when to plant when to harvest when the raining season would begin uh, to when to do their ritual sacrifices. Ancient astronomers were just like us. Um, in terms of like intellectual capability, they just didn't have necessarily the same kinds of tools, and they didn't have the same kinds of understandings. But boy, could they be observational astronomers and did an incredible job. So you know, to line up the positions of, of buildings to you know, centimeter accuracy based on what you see in the sky is trivial for uh, for someone who is, you know, really dedicates their life to observing the sky. Jacob Polisek, what are the most interesting citizen science projects in the astronomy space field right now? You know, there's a lot of great citizen science projects. You know, there's the Zooniverse, where they've got a bunch of projects where people can go and get involved in them. There's the work that we do at CosmoQuest, which is led by my astronomy cast co host. And then there's like ongoing various citizen science projects, uh, people who are helping to confirm exoplanets, variable star astronomers, people who are looking through data from NASA telescopes to discover comets that are grazing the sun. So there's all kinds of ongoing work that citizen scientists can get in involved in. It's time to shout out all the new $5 patrons and above Travis M, Alex Watchnick, guest informant, Goa Bites, Peter Lewis, True Hartwood, Andy Murray, David America, Keith Pedden, and Marcus. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Osiris MPG, could a ship traveling to Alpha Centauri crash directly into a black hole the size of a few meters? How would such a collision unfold? How fast would it happen? Would the astronauts feel anything at all? So if a spacecraft hit a black hole that was a few meters across, then then that would mean you have the mass of like Jupiter. I'm trying to think so if you had a black hole, the mass of the Earth, it would be a centimeter across. If you had a black hole, the mass of the sun, it would be a kilometer across. So I'm sort of imagining something a few meters across, you're having the mass of Jupiter. And so if you crashed a spacecraft into Jupiter, it would be catastrophic for the spacecraft. So yeah, it would, you know, the gravity of the impact would dismantle the spacecraft uh, very quickly. Now you could hit something with say, the mass of an asteroid and it would just pass right through, punch a nice little hole because the gravity wouldn't be strong enough to really cause any failure to the superstructure of your spacecraft. But if you're going to hit the mass of Jupiter, unless you're I don't know, made of some kind of unobtainium, it's going to cause stress to the structural elements of your spacecraft. In other words, uh, dismantle it. Funky critter, why is the Earth spinning? Will it stop eventually? The Earth is spinning because it's just the leftover momentum from all of the particles that collided to create the Earth. If you sort of take the average motion of everything that made up the Earth, you end up with a rotation. And will it stop spinning? Um, no, the Earth has been spinning for four and a half billion years and will continue to spin until the sun engulfs us and destroys the Earth. Now, the speed that we are spinning is slowing down thanks to our interaction with the gravity of the moon. But it's only going to be a tiny little bit um, before the Earth is destroyed by the sun. HES, is there a place in our galaxy where we can see majestic nebulae with the naked eye like in long exposure photos? Uh, no. No, you could never see a nebula that would look anything like what you see in the photographs. And that's just because even if you were really close to the Orion Nebula, uh, it wouldn't look very good that you need to be able to take a long exposure to be able to see it. And in fact, it's another weird thing that happens, which is that the closer that you get to a thing, 
like the Orion Nebula, the more its light is spread out into a larger object in the sky. So even if you get closer, the light is less concentrated It's coming from a larger area in the sky. And so it still wouldn't be great until you took a long exposure picture from your spacecraft, then it will look great again. But no, unfortunately, like globular clusters, absolutely star clusters, they look great. Galaxies, I mean, you're in the middle of the Milky Way, right? You're looking at the densest part of the Milky Way. And it looks like this faint cloud if you've got good dark skies. Andromeda couldn't be in a better position. It is much bigger than the full moon. We're seeing this spiral shape in the sky. And yet, uh, when you look up at it, you you have to know where you're looking and you have to have good dark skies and you have to kind of squint your eyes uh, and you'll see a little fuzzy patch in the sky. That's the best you can do. It's only when you do a long exposure with a camera, do you actually get to see anything interesting. So unfortunately, that's the same no matter where you go in the universe, you're not going to see really cool spiral galaxies, you're not going to see uh, beautiful nebulae, you're going to see maybe a sort of a fuzzy patch over in the sky, a gray fuzzy patch. Nolan Mosley, with all the satellites in low Earth orbit, how long until all the progress on closing the ozone layer is undone? Satellites aren't doing any long lasting damage to the ozone layer. Uh, the ozone layer is like an altitude of 25 kilometers and satellites fly at an altitude of like 500 kilometers and the rockets that are launching them are emitting greenhouse gas. So they're going to contribute to global warming, but not necessarily destruction of the ozone layer. The destruction of the ozone layer came from uh, chlorofluorocarbons. And now that we've been that we are no longer releasing chlorofluorocarbons, then the ozone layer will continue to heal. So the concern about satellites is that when they get to the end of their lifetime, and they re enter the Earth's atmosphere, they're made of various particles, and the satellites burn up in the atmosphere and they release those particles into the atmosphere. And they can potentially cause damage to the ozone layer. And then the question is just going to be, you know, how many satellites, what kinds of chemicals, how much damage are we going to be looking at? And this gets you to this sort of weird tension. On the one hand, you want to make sure that if you're going to launch a satellite, you're going to have it re enter the atmosphere at the end of its life. Because otherwise, if the satellites stay up, they become a hazard for other satellites, you don't want that. So it, it is best practice to deorbit your satellites. On the other hand, if you're actually going to cause damage and contribute to both global warming and maybe, you know, delay the recovery of the ozone layer, then that's a downside as well. And so like, once again, we have this tragedy of the commons, right, we have this thing, we have this resource, low Earth orbit, and we are unfortunately just going to stampede to a place where it's going to make it harder to use that resource in the future. The research into like they're going to potentially cause damage to the ozone layer. This is very new. I don't think we have a really good sense of exactly what the outcome is going to be. Nan P90, if evil aliens were trying to find us, would there be a way for us to make Earth invisible to them? Uh, sort of. So the proposal is that you know, think about the transit method, the way we find exoplanets. So we watch as a planet passes in front of the star. And we watch how the light dims from the star briefly as the planet is passing in front. So theoretically, um, you could fire a laser on the other side of your planet in the direction of the of the stars that would be able to observe your transit. And you could match the brightness of the dip in light, then anyone who's trying to use the transit method to observe you wouldn't be able to detect a change in the brightness from your planet. And so that would allow you to hide the presence of your planet, theoretically, but that wouldn't help with the direct imaging method, uh, or the radio velocity method. So it would be a very obscure way to try and hide your planet. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call that Q&A plus and this week's bonus question. What's the difference between cosmology and astronomy? I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had this episode. Thank you everyone who asked your questions in the YouTube comments, everybody who joined me for the various live shows that this was pulled from. We are back to our new season. There will already be an event here on the channel for the next live show, which is going to be 
scheduled for the European viewer. So it'll be morning my time evening for people in Europe. And I'm not sure what you know, what time you live in. Uh, so definitely go and check that out. Uh, now I'm going to chat about uh, various sort of intro to astronomy gear that I recommend. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Barry Lake Roofing, Brian Body, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Baylock, Cy Nielsen, David Varabioff, David Gilton, and David Matz, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hudson Moore, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Marcel Smiths, Michael Purcell, Monto, Paul Robach, Ren Kaidu, Richard Williams, Sean Sargent, Stephen Father Munley, Vlad Chaplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. So in the most recent live show, I was getting a bunch of questions about good starter gear for astronomy. And I thought I would just go through my regular recommendations in case you are wondering, you're thinking about holiday gifts and so on. My top number one recommendation, if you don't have a lot of money to spend and you want to dramatically increase your astronomy access is to get a pair of astronomical binoculars. They're just like binoculars, but they are much bigger and they have a much larger aperture that allows you to magnify and bring more light into your eyeballs. And there's a bunch of different companies that make astronomical binoculars. The ones that I tend to recommend are the Celestron Skymasters, a pair of like 15 by 70s. They should run you about $100. And they are just a phenomenal tool. You can see the rings of Saturn. You can see the moons of Jupiter, bands across the planet. You can see craters on the moon. You can see nebulae, galaxies, star clusters. It's kind of amazing. You look in the Milky Way and you just see more stars. And then you can use them for bird watching too. They're heavy and they make an even heavier version. You can get like a 25 by 100s. They're really heavy. So I recommend the 15 by 70s, but the bigger is generally better if you can hold the weight of them. And then if you feel like you're still really enjoying it, and you want to continue on, then I recommend you get the Dobsonian telescope. This is they call these light buckets. They are the the sort of the least expensive high power telescopes that you can get. They're very simple to use and operate. They have an alt azimuth mount, they tilt up and down, turn side to side. If you see a thing in the sky, they'll have a finder scope, they're very easy to point at, they're easy to fix, easy to use. The only downside is you have to collimate them from time to time, you have to make sure that their mirrors are back in alignment. But just in general, they're a very inexpensive telescope to use. So uh, do a search for a Dobsonian telescope, even like a six inch Dobsonian is a great first starter telescope. And that's the one that you'll take out when the moon is up, you'll have people look through your telescope and you will uh, impress everybody. So if you're looking for like the first pieces of astronomy gear, pair of binoculars or a Dobsonian telescope. All right, we'll see you next time.